Hey everyone, it's Thursday the 19th of January and it's 1.45 in the afternoon. Now a couple of days ago I was talking to a good friend of mine, Kat. Now, she doesn't mind being named on camera, I've already cleared that with her. Anyway, yeah we haven't spoken for several months, not on the phone at least. We do on Facebook, but uh, it's the first time for a few months that we've spoken on the phone. We spoke for a good couple of hours actually. That was a... Good to talk to her again. Anyway, she was telling me how she wants to uh, start her own model railway. And uh, she was asking me, you know, a lot of questions on sort of like the um, track and whatnot and base and lots of different questions. And uh, she then suggested, why don't I do a video talking about such things? Um, so I thought, why not? <laughs> I haven't done a model railway video in a long time, so here we are. I mean, I think die-cast cars have taken over quite a lot recently. I've got an itch. That's right where I can't reach. Anyway, <clears throat> so I want to, um, you know, start with the base, as you need a base to put the model on. And I'll talk about the sort of materials I've used and throw a few other ideas out there, if I can think of any. Um, and the type of track I've used and the materials you'll need. Got some tools here to go through. There is some must-haves in there. Uh, the types of controllers. Um, the type of system you might want to use, as in DC or DCC. Yeah, there's quite a lot to talk about in this video. Now, I'm not an expert, so I could get things wrong. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, just keep that in mind, I'm not an expert, I don't claim to be an expert. <coughs> I've taken so many takes of doing this video, I'm getting a very dry throat. My can is nearly empty, I might have to get another one. So, let's start with the base. Now, I'm kind of strapped for space being in a one bedroom flat but I was determined to get a model railway in here and I have to say it I was thinking for quite a few days on how I could do this so I came up with the folding the fold away layout you can actually see one of the catches up there so when this folds away a dead bolt just slides and locks into that there's two of them I've got one either side there's the other one, just the other side of the light. So there's the base. So yeah, I decided on a um, <clears throat> a fold away type base. Now, if I had a bit more room, as in I didn't have a bench up this corner and some um, stackable drawer things there and some all the boxes of model railway stuff that needed storing, I could have actually built this on its own table and put some caster wheels on the bottom and just had it so I could wheel it around the room you know and then just tuck it up that corner out of the way but that wasn't going to work <laughs> so I wanted the bench so I could store the boxes of model railway stuff on that bench so I went out and bought a four foot by eight foot sheet of MDF I don't know why I picked MDF I could have picked ply but for some reason I picked MDF and uh, me and my stepdad, we framed it up. Um, and then I pulled the bench out from the wall, a good two, two and a half foot, something like that. I couldn't come out too far because I needed to leave space when this was down. So I could open the uh, cupboard here to get to my clothes and whatnot. It does block the other door off. But you open this right hand door first anyway, so it doesn't matter that that one's blocked off. I can still reach in and get my clothes and things, so yeah, anyway. I've also anchored that shelf to the skirt and board on the wall. Um, not shelf, the bench. Just to stop it tilting and twisting, really. Um, and yeah, we basically screwed hinges to the back of that bench. That allows this to hinge up then, so all we've got to do is just grab it like that. 
got to make sure the floor is clear because I've got to walk forwards with it. So I've got to make sure all under there is clear. Um, three legs at the front. Which aren't on camera at the minute. I wish I had a cameraman. So when I point things out like that, they can move the camera for me. Yeah, I've got these legs. Three of these. The cross beam. I don't know if that's on camera. No, it's not. Uh, they are on hinges as well. So the advantage with that is when I lower it, those legs just fold out by themselves and then drop on the floor. I do have to fettle them a little bit because they don't always fall dead straight. Um, which doesn't bother me, but with this one, if it falls a little bit further out, it blocks that door. So I do have to just nudge it in. I had to do that earlier. Um, but yeah, other than that, it works great <laughs> for what I need. You know, and then... When I'm bored with the model railway and I'm done modelling or it's going to be a while before I get more materials to model on it, I can just fold it away and uh, well, perhaps in this case concentrate a bit on other hobbies like I have been the die cast for a while. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, what I picked, or the method I picked I should say. Um, I mean, if you've got the space, you could just go all out and fill up a complete room if you've got a spare empty room. Or a loft, or um, a garage or something, or shed. Unfortunately, I haven't got that much space here. So I thought this was a good way to do it. The disadvantage is I have to obviously pack away all the locomotives and rolling stock and everything else. I can't just leave it on here. Um, there's that disadvantage but I do find keeping it stored up like that seems to keep the dirt and the dust to a minimum on the track itself which is quite handy <laughs> it means less cleaning in fact when I get it down all I do is just go over the track once with one of my track cleaning rubbers which I'll show you when we look at the tools in a bit um, <clears throat> Yeah, so that's the base. And then, of course, before we start building, you might want to decide on a theme. Now, I do see arguments over themes and whatnot on um, some of these model railway groups on Facebook. There seems to be that there are people out there that seems to think the only way and the proper way to do a model railway is to base it on a real-life railway line. Now, I don't know, it's fine if that's how they feel, but they will go on Facebook and some of them will actually attack others because they've had the balls to, you know, build something fictional or, you know, done their own thing because it's not right, you know, it's not true to real life. It's a model, you know, it's a bit like Lego. It can be as realistic or as unrealistic as you want. It's yours. You're the one building it. You decide what you want to do. If you want to base it on real life, you know, and be as exact to real life as you want, if you want to build it on a real life railway line, you know, with replica buildings on along that line and whatnot and replica stations, go for it. If you want to build something completely fictional, Go for it. You shouldn't have people attacking you just because you're doing something your way. That to me just makes you an asshole. <clears throat> so, you know, there are a number of different themes out there now that I've got that off my chest. <laughs> I don't know, it just irks me when people attack others for doing something their way. You know, who cares? <laughs> anyway. So, some people, as I said, they do base it on real-life railways and they'll replicate all the buildings and stations along the way and whatnot. Um, other people will just do complete fiction, but they might base it in a certain decade, so they might base it in 1960s, or as my stepdad has, he's doing a complete fictional railway line, but he's setting it in the 1970s. Uh, with me, I've picked modern times, but I've picked, as well, Preservation Railway. 
So my basic theme is it's set in like a modern town or village, whatever you want to call it. I'll leave that to you, you know, the viewer's own interpretation, whether they want it to be a village or a town. Obviously it'll only be a small part of a town if I do um, do it that way. Um, with the preserved railway, which means I can run whatever locomotive I want from whatever era I want. And I can, in my opinion, I can have a bit more fun. Because obviously when I get it down, I'll have to set the cars and vehicles and whatnot up. doesn't matter about people, I can glue those in place. But I don't really want to glue my cars in place. So, I thought, you know, as I've got to set things up like that, when I get it down, and I want to take a photo of it, you know, I could like have a classic car day set up. I could put like a little green somewhere over there where I could park the cars on, like a little field or something I could set up. And there could be like a classic car meet going on. You know, because I could change it that day. I could get a load of classic tractors and then what, another day have a load of classic tractors parked up there. You know, and have a, cl <laughs> a classic a vintage tractor show. You know, I can change everything. <clears throat> I, mean, I wouldn't mind getting a few modern trains. Most of mine are actually uh, vintage based. No, that's like 37, which coincidentally is not just one of my favourites, but one of Cat's favourites as well. I haven't got, I was hoping I had a third one spare, but I'm pretty certain I sold that one. Otherwise, I was going to give that one to her. <clears throat> but yeah, unfortunately, I'm pretty certain I sold it a while back now. Um, so yeah, once you've got your theme chosen, you can then think about uh, putting your track down. Or well, suppose you don't really need to pick a theme, you could just go complete fictional, you know, just go with the flow sort of thing if you wanted to um, yeah I have to say I didn't actually go online looking for track plans you know for inspiration because you can do that you get them in um, well, the railway magazines as well or you could go on the Facebook groups and see what other people have done to get inspiration I just literally went with the flow with my track plan obviously I wanted a loop so I thought wherever I start I've got to start with that continuous loop so what I've done, I've got a point over in that far corner, which comes off into what I call the Preserved Railway Yard. And then I've got one, two, three, four, five, six sidings. Technically, I've got two lines that go in at the railway shed, then four sidings. Um, and each one of these sidings is powered individually. I've got, or will have them on a switch box here. I'll explain more about these switch boxes in a bit. Cat did ask me about those. Um, yeah. Now, I did change this track plan twice, I think, in the time I was building this. Um, and that's one of the reasons it took me so long to get started on the scenery, because I wanted to get the track plan, you know, to the point where I was 100% happy with it before I started doing all the scenery and whatnot. Because it's glued down. And it's not cheap. I mean, I could scrape all of this track ballast off that I've already put down, but I have to go in the bin and I have to buy fresh. <laughs> so that is why I wanted the track, especially exactly as I wanted it. And I am happy with it now. I don't want to add to it. I'm happy with a single loop. I could have had an internal loop, but I proved that proved, at least to me, a bit too uh, complicated getting it. To you know, the outer loop to cross over that to get into the uh, yard that I, I just couldn't get it to set up how I wanted it, which is one reason I scrapped it. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, you're also going to need, for your track lane, two things. Track pins. And I've got some spare, so as and when you watch this cat, if you want them, there's some there. And of course, to join the track together, you're going to need fish plates. Now, if you're lucky and you get second-hand track, you sometimes get fish plates left on them. But they might not be a lot of good, so it wouldn't hurt just to get some more. But uh, 
I can spare some of mine. I've got plenty in here, so I can spare some. See, I'm not sure of any, and I've already got most of my track laid, so... Unless I decided to build an end-to-end -end line somewhere, I don't think I'm going to need that many now. So I've got some of them spare for you as well. And of course, to put the track down, you're going to need a hammer, so... I've got a little pin hammer here. I have got another one somewhere, I just don't know where it's gone. I've got a slightly smaller one. Which is actually better for this, because the end of it actually goes between the track. That one's slightly bigger. So I actually, <laughs> to knock the pins in with this one, I actually end up using this bit. <clears throat> um, some modellers I've seen, they don't just put the track straight on the board like this, like I have. Let me just lower that camera a bit. There we go. They put like um, a foam padding underneath. You can actually buy it in strips. Um... Yeah, and then they put the pins through and pin it down. Actually, what they do, they glue the foam padding down and then they pin the track to that. Um, that's what my step, stepdad has done, and that's something he's always done. Although on the last model he built, he did try cork, but I don't think he was that happy with that, because he's gone back to the foam stuff that you can buy. One advantage is with that, it makes the track look a bit more realistic. Um... Because when you look at a real track, it looks like the gravel is on an angle, angles up to the track, um, which is what that foam allows you to do. But I'm not too fussed about that. I'm happy with it looking flat like this, to be honest. <clears throat> I have noticed I've got a few bare spots to fill in on this as well. Um, scenery, though, I'm going to go into more detail on scenery in another video, because otherwise that'll be too much for this one. Yeah, so I think that covers track. Um, of course, you need somewhere to put power in, so I've just used a standard Hornby power track there. Literally, I can just unplug and plug in whatever controller I've got, because I can just push down on these two little buttons and pull it out. So as long as I put that plug on a controller, that's why this has got a connection in there, because I had to connect that up to it. You can just go doesn't matter which way around it goes because of you know, different directions. It just means the switch on this one might be reversed, that's all. <clears throat> yeah, I think that covers track. Um, what should I cover next? I think before we get to the tools and everything I might as well continue with the layout. So. You're going to need a controller. Now there's two ways you can con well, <laughs> you can control your locomotives. I've got there in the end. That's with just a standard DC controller like I've got here. You know, just simple controller, plugs into your track through a... Well, you can either use this or you could just solder the wires straight to the track. It's up to you. I just chose that just in case I want to switch out the uh, controllers. It means, you know, if this fails for whatever reason, I can actually swap it quite easily. And then I've just got a power supply plugged into the back of that. Simple. <laughs> um, a DCC is more expensive, at least buying the locomotives and the controller. I mean, I've seen controllers for like five, six hundred quid just for a controller. Depends on the model you get, though. Um, but... Uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, DCC is also a little bit more uh, complicated to set up, as in there's a little bit more work to do. This one is just literally a single power point on the track, connected, simple. When you want to use DCC, you need multiple power points on the track. So what my stepdad does, he puts in power at each join on the track he's got two bus wires that run around the whole layout so he's got positive and negative bus wire that goes all the way around the layout and what he'll do he'll get the fish plates he'll solder wires to the bottom of them drill a couple of holes where the track joins push them through connect the track up to the fish plates 
you know, fix all the trap down. And those two wires that drop through the board then connect to the bus wires. So there's power taken to each individual part of the track because um, DCC is a bit more sensitive. It needs that um, a good power source all the way around. So it's a bit more complicated in that sense. Well, I suppose it's not that complicated. It's just a bit more work that you've got to do to set it up. Um, as well as you need to either buy a locomotive with DCC already fitted, which is expensive, the cheaper way would actually be to buy the DCC chip yourself and fit it to the locomotive. Any one of these can be fitted with it. I could upgrade all of these to DCC if I want to. I'm not sure about that one, because without actually taking this little one apart, I'm not sure if there's going to be enough room for the chip in there to make it DCC. Um, but once you've done that and you've got the controller, the advantage is it brings a lot more life to your rail, um, to your railway layout, and a bit more realism. I mean, my stepdad's also got DCC sound on a couple of his locomotives, and with his DCC controller, he can actually set this because he's got 37 with sound. So it does a start-up cycle first, so it plays the sound of the engine starting up. And then it will start to move in sync with the engine revving up. That is pretty good. And the faster this goes, the more the engine revs up. Um, so it does bring a good amount of realism and detail to your layout. That's the biggest advantage with DCC. And if you've got a big layout like my stepdad, where he's got at least four loops going all the way around his layout, he can actually run all four at the same time, have a different sound on each one playing at the same time. Um, he can also shuffle a shunter around in his sidings at the same time as having four going around the layout. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's one of the big advantage with a DCC control. It's quite expensive, like I said. It's just that extra bit of work to set it up. So now that I think about it, I don't know if it's so much as so much complicated as it is just that extra bit of work. You know, you've got to solder all the um, wires in for the DCC and the locos. You've got to take all that apart. Unless you're willing to spend the money and buy one that's um, fitted. Second-hand ones are obviously going to be cheaper than brand new ones. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah... I chose DC because I just wanted a simple running layout and yeah I'm quite happy as it is. I mean I could have got DCC with this and just had that extra realism. I mean I don't need it to run the extra locos, not really because I've only got the one loop I have now. So yeah that's why I picked DC. Um, when it comes to DC controllers there are a number out there. I would recommend not using, unless you absolutely have to, <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of those new ones that come in the Hornby train sets, the black and silver crappy things. Um, because for that reason, they are crap. I've used them. Yes, they work. Yes, they do the job. But they're just not suitable for a layout like this. The, Pretty much, you know, for a kid who's just got it set up on the carpet. <clears throat> I mean, if you're literally just getting going and that's the only control you can get hold of, then use it. It's going to be perfectly fine, but for long term, I wouldn't use it. This one, I actually find is a fairly decent term controller. Which is why I'm using it. And it's actually got two terminals here, so I could take power to some lights or something if I wanted to. The power for my lights is going to be separate. I won't remember where I put the adapter for it. <laughs> In fact, it was probably laying over there and I've moved it by now and probably forgotten what it was there for. Um, just bear with me for a minute. I'm just going to pause. Right, I'm back. With a nice fresh cold can. That 
where well, I was talking about the controllers. You could, if you wanted to, you could go for a, you know, a vintage controller if you can find them. Um, reasonably, oh, they were last time I looked, quite reasonably priced. You see, I've got two. I've got this one, a triangle model. So you get the forward reverse control there. It's different on that Hornby one, you have to flick a switch. But I actually use this one um, for testing locos when I'm fixing them and maintaining them and whatnot because I've got a bit of track about a metre long on a piece of wood much like actually it could have been a piece of wood left over from doing the framework for the table um, and I just clip power wires on the back I'm going to put another alligator clip on it because that's come off um, but the reason I like using this one for testing the loco is if I've got a faulty one that's got a dead short on it this has got a little trip there and obviously if there's an overload, because of a dead short, it will trip that. Which um, lowers the risk of uh, burning your motor out or something. Or you know, doing some damage to the loco. Um, I'll just read in the back. So we've got a 15 volt AC output. I don't know if that's switched. This thing got 12 volt switched output. And then 12 volt unswitched output. But you've only got two screws, only gear them. <laughs> anyway, the other controller, which I was using, which I think I'm going to put up for sale. <clears throat> oh, unless Cat wants to buy it from me because I haven't got a use for it anymore. It's this uh, duet one. Obviously I was using this when I had the two loops going around, but now I've only got the one, that's pretty much surplus to requirements. It does fully work. Again, there's just two wires there, either side. But then again, if you're only running one train, then you wouldn't want this anyway. If you're only running one loop, I mean. you would be better off just getting a cheapy little black one like what I've got here. <clears throat> but... I'll, uh, that's the wrong can. I'll leave that up to cat. Right. So I've got up to controllers. Now, she did ask me the other day on Facebook what these were for. Because she was looking at some of my older model railway videos on YouTube. So, um, these have all got a purpose, all three of them. So, that one is going to operate all my lighting, all the street lights, all the lights in the buildings, etc. In fact, the only one that's working, I can't demonstrate it now because I don't know where the adapter is, is my cottage, which is over on that corner. Um, that operates the light inside that and the street light. And the street lights are just LED lights. You can find them on eBay, but be warned, some of them are not cheap. Depending on what style you get and whether they come from China or not. Um, I'm actually just trying to find one. I had one here earlier because Smudge was playing with it. Um, I've thrown it in one of these tubs and now I can't find it. But yeah, the modern ones obviously they just have tiny little LED in them. I think you can get cold white LEDs, warm white LEDs. Anywho, so yeah, that's what that one's going to be for. So once I've got all the roads sorted out and the street lights in and all the um, train yard floodlights in and whatnot, they'll all be operated from here. But this one is to um, basically switch on and off all the sidings I've got, as well as the two lines that go into the railway shed. So this will allow me when I've got it set up like this, to leave locomotives on the sidings um, and I can turn that siding you know, off and when I'm running a train around the edge, the train on the siding is not going to move as well. Otherwise, you know, the track would be permanently live and they will move when I'm trying to run a train around the loop. 
So that is just basically just to isolate the sidings and the two um, tracks into the shed. And the final one, the third one, that's going to operate all the motorised points. So over the back there, I can't remember how many I've got without counting them. I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six point motors. I have actually got them installed. I haven't wired them up yet. That's a job I've still got to do. There's still sort of like a lot of wires poking through and it looks like I've still got some wires to poke through. Um, it looks more complicated than it actually is. It's literally just one negative wire, you know, just one common negative wire to go through them all. And then three switch wires. Now the switches, even though they look the same, they are different. Now these are your basic on-off switches. Hang on. I told you I need a cameraman because I forget to move the camera. <laughs> so yeah, these ones and these ones are obviously just your bog standard on-off switch. Um, these ones for your point mowers, they are momentary, so you just flick them up like that. So that would move them one way, that would move them the other. So I'd have to put a common live to the middle, and probably a common live to the middle on the uh, point mowers themselves, which are just basically little electronic solenoids, that's all they are. And then that would just basically make the solenoid move in and out when you do that thus moving your point in and out. Not necessary on a layout like this, but to be honest, it's a lot easier. Otherwise, I've got to lean over everything and perhaps use a stick or something to switch the points. So I just thought, you know what, for an extra bit of wiring and an extra bit of solder practice, I'll just put some point motors in. I do need to disguise them. Two or three of them are actually disguised as little huts. I haven't got a pointy stick. <laughs> Um, you see that one and that one over the back there and this one right over here the hut has actually fallen off of it but they are disguised as little huts but I want to disguise these as something else because I don't want you know a half a dozen huts oh, I'm just using the ruler to scratch my back <clears throat> yeah um, I think that covers the controls. Um, there's a lot of soldering to do. I mean, to get the um, sidings insulated, what I had to do was use a plastic fish plate on one connection, because um, obviously that insulates that connection, and a metal one on the other one, and it's just simply two wires going either side of that plastic one coming down to a switch here. That is that simple to isolate the um, sidings. <clears throat> I don't think they're all working though because I'm a bit sucky at the soldering over there and I've got some that haven't been soldered from the looks of it. So I've still got that all to sort out. Um, Yeah, so I think we can actually go on to the basic tools of the trade, so to speak. So, I've got this which has been smudged on that corner. It looks like just a foam sponge, but it is quite useful. Hang on, let me just readjust the camera a bit. So what you do with this, this makes servicing locos uh, a lot easier, even though it's so simple. Because you can just grab a loco, turn it upside down, put it in there, then you've got something that's holding a loco while you clean your wheels. Or service your motors and bogies and whatnot. So that's very handy. I've got to keep that out of the way of smudge because he's got a bloody thing again um, for sponges. And in case anybody didn't know, I think I mentioned it in the other video, um, in a previous video, smudge is actually a boy. <laughs> Um, always thought he was a girl. That is what I was told when we went to um, look at him and pick him out. But no, nope, it turns out that she is actually a he. So I've got another little boy who's actually asleep just behind the camera on the floor. I don't know why he's on the floor. 
lovely soft bed over here in the bedroom. Not, he's in the uh, lounge doorway on the floor. You could even go to sleep on the uh, computer chair as I'm not on that. Right. So, tools. You know, there are certain things that you're going to need for doing the artistic side of things. I'm not very artistic myself, but I've still got them. We've already looked at the hammer. So I've got a metal rule. I don't think this one's got the scale on it. No, it hasn't. It's the centimetres and inches. But I have got one of these somewhere, which has actually got scales on it for modelling. That doesn't seem to be in here. I've also got a little one. Centimetres on that side, inches on that side. Ooh, it's a Stanley. Didn't realise that. It's a bit flexible, though, from Stanley. <laughs> Does it go? It goes up to six inches. And it's got 9p engraved in it for some reason. Six inches, 15 centimetres. It's a bit like the old little school plastic rulers you get. Uh, what else have I got in here? I've got some solder in here. I've got solder elsewhere as well. Handy for doing electric work. Same as the lighters. That one's out of gas. <laughs> um, for heat shrink and things, for when you're servicing trains, you might have to do a repair. Need a bit of heat shrink. So that's why I've got a little, little lighter in here as well. It's missing its guard, but it does work, and it is full of gas. And I get a refill for that one. A sparking, isn't it? Yes, just out of gas. Um, I've got a set of wire strippers in here, again, just for the electrical work. I've got an assortment of uh, various paint brushes, which are handy for the painting and gluing and whatnot. And a solder sucker again for when I'm doing the soldering. I've got some files and things in here as well, it's just in case I need to file anything down for modelling. I've not had to yet, but they're here. Yeah, I have actually used them on die casts. So, at least if they're in here, I'll know where they are. Um, I'd also get a pack of these precision um, craft knives. Just be careful because they are bloody sharp. I've got a couple of those. Um, various uh, precision screwdrivers and things in here. And I've got Phillips and flatheads of various sizes and whatnot. So you need a good assortment of uh, precision type screwdrivers. <clears throat> so it'll come in handy for taking your um, locos apart and servicing them. Um, obviously you're going to need glue. Now I find it's a good idea to have different glues available. So I've got hot glue. I also keep super glue at hand. I find different glues work better with different materials. And I've got stone wall going around the um, cottage over there and I actually found that hot glue um, stuck that down a lot better. And then you get PVA, that's actually a mix in this bowl, um, tub. That's um, PVA mixed down or watered down with water. And that is used for um, the ballast. Yeah, bottle of PVA glue is also good. You can also use the PVA glue if you build the model kits, the buildings up. Um, although my stepdad is using a uh, super glue for cardboard that he got on Amazon. It was 11 quid a bottle and the bottle's only about that big. Um, but he reckoned it is absolutely brilliant for doing these card model kits. Because <clears throat> it dries so quick. With PVA glue you'd have to glue a few bits together of the cardboard model and then leave that to dry for about an hour and then come back to it. Um, but yeah, he has actually built a whole cardboard building kit in one sitting using this glue. I was actually watching him when I was over there last. So I may get some of that myself. I can't remember what it's called at the minute though. So I'll have to, well, I'll ask my stepdad when I'm over there next. Uh, is there anything else? Standing knife, I do like to keep one of those in here as well. I've got a couple of syringes because they help for um, 
that PVA glue and whatnot, especially this. I'll explain more when I get to that. That's how I'm going to do the scenery in another video. <clears throat> um, we also need a few, I suppose you could call them specialist tools um, and equipment. I mean, you're going to need servicing oil. I've got two of these because I thought I'd lost one. Well, in fact, the first one I bought ages ago, I stood on it and burst, so I lost all the oil that way. So I bought a replacement. And then I thought that one got lost because I couldn't find it, so I bought another one. And then naturally, <laughs> the other one turned up. So I've just got two of them. These are for um, oiling your locomotives. Don't use anything like 3-in-1 or WD-4. Use the proper oil. And you only need a teeny little drop. But I will do a video um, servicing one of my locos and showing you how to use that. Uh, just have a look in here. Here. Yeah, these little stirrers are quite handy as well. And I've got various pens and pencils in here as well. Might be why I can never find a pen. <laughs> right, so in my hand, I've got this little device which is for setting up a specific style of port point motor, which I don't have. So that really isn't any use to me at the minute. Because um, you can get point motors that screw to the surface, like mine do. Or you get the ones that go underneath the layout and out of sight. This is used to help line that up. That's what that's for. Uh, then I've got this, which is to space your track. So, you've got like three or four straight lines of track side by side. You can space it using this because you can set this to whatever space you need, like that. And it'll even turn like this so you can do it for the curves as well to get your space right. Screw that down and you can actually make your spacing equal all the way down. Don't think I actually need this anymore. Um, in fact, I've never used it. I haven't got a... <laughs> oh, actually, I think I did use it when I had the two loops on, but that was it. Um, then you've got this little doicky, which helps for when you're bouncing the track because it smooths everything off, neatens everything up with the brushes. you just got a couple of grooves here that line up with your track. So you've got your ballast on there, then you can just run this over it like that. And that'll help clean any loose stuff off as well. And for the locos, other than the oil, you've got these, which are wheel spacers. So, if you've got a loco, which is sort of um, shuffling side to side like that, it could be that the wheels are not spaced wide enough. So you just put one of these in and that will double check it and make sure your wheels are at the right spacing. Now, I have no idea why I've got a couple of these, because I don't know where... The, my stepdad gave me one, I don't know where the second one came from. And of course... For track maintenance, again, you can get all sorts. You can get um, wagons that can be pulled around by a locomotive to clean your track. Um, well, because mine's so small, I've just got these. Track rubbers. You can tell I've used this one a bit more because it's got the grooves um, being cut into it. Um, which actually makes me glad at the time. I actually bought a couple of them. They sort of sparkle a bit like uh, sharpening stones, don't they? But they're not. They're not as hard as sharpening stones. But they're not as soft as a pencil eraser either. They're sort of somewhere in between. But they are very handy. And all, I, all you need to do is just... You don't need to put any force on. I just run them over like that. And I do that once every time I get the railway down. That's all I do. I just go over the, round the whole thing once. I haven't done the sidings because I'm not using them at the minute. Um, I think yeah, there is a couple more items, but at least for this tray, that is it tool-wise. Um, apart from a Dremel or a rotary tool, something like that. Very handy along with all the attachments. And I find this is what I use to cut the tracks. Sometimes you have to cut them to length. 
and trim off all the plastic sleepers on them. So yeah, I find that that cutting disc is very useful on a rotary tool. Um, and also for cleaning, especially the locos and whatnot, is to get yourself a bottle of uh, IPA isopropyl alcohol. That's 99.9% .9 pure alcohol, so don't drink it. Drinking that, you'd probably be uh, in a six foot hole somewhere. I wouldn't put up uh, any good chances because that is strong stuff. Uh, and of course, it's handy to have some cotton buds as well. Uh, I think that is actually it. Yeah. Well, of course, for soldering, you're going to need a soldering iron as well. Um, but I don't think you're going to need anything fancy for this sort of stuff. I just use um, 240 volt plug in mains ones. Um, I have got a soldering station so I can set the temperature, but I don't really use that one. I prefer the, uh, the, the straight up plug in ones with uh, some decent soldering tips. Uh, hmm. Something else you might need to collect up as well. And salvage wire and I've got bucket loads of it different sort of I suppose the Americans would call it gauge wouldn't they different gauges I think this is old telephone wire but quite flexible stuff so I can't remember what that came out of could have even been an old ethernet cable or something like that but yeah that's uh, good stuff to keep hold of because obviously you're going to need it if you uh, run or use lights and point motors and things like I'm going to use. You're going to need a fair bit of this. Um, but personally, I think I've gone a bit overkill on the wire, don't you? I don't think I'm going to need all this. I mean, you can get spools like this on Amazon. You can get them in a box of various colours. And these wires just poke through a hole in the box so you can just pull off whatever you need. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Actually the spools of wire they're not actually that um, expensive on Amazon and you can either get um, multi-cord or single cord as well depending on your preference. Obviously the uh, multi-cord stuff is going to be more flexible than the single cord that's quite stiff so it just depends what you want it for. I got stiff and I'm thinking I should have got the uh, multi-cord um, I've got single cord rather than I should have got the multi cord really. It's a bit easier to work with. Right. Um, I think that is it, but what I will do, I'm going to put one of my 37s on. I'm beginning to wish I didn't sell my third one. Because now that I know um, it's one of Cat's favourite locos, I could have just given it to her. Ooh, DMU was in the way. No, oh, that sponge is in the way as well. Just want to put these other bits of tools in here out of the way. Away it goes. When I first started this, a 37 was one that I definitely wanted. Yeah, I want to keep two because you can double head them, you can put two together. That's why I've got two identical ones. The other one, I'm, now that I remember, the other one had a different, slightly different colour or slightly different shade of the blue with a big British Rail symbol right in the middle. That's, I think that's why I got rid of that one. And that was a very temperamental loco. In fact, I had to bodge it to get it to work. Because <laughs> um, part of the actual motor had broken, so it wasn't making connection. So I literally got a big stiff bit of copper wire. And I had to wedge that in there. And every now and again, that would come out of place. And I'd have to take it apart and put it back in. Great if someone had a spare uh, motor for it to fix it. Or if you, I mean, you could have used the motor for spare parts, but yeah, that wasn't fixable. Not without that bodge. But 
but uh, yeah, so I kept the identical ones. I have got spare plastic bodies for a 37, but that's it. Or I used to have them anyway. Uh, well, they're actually looking in my uh, parts box over there, which has got lots of other, you know, scenery stuff and whatnot in it. I can't tell you <laughs> if I've still got them or not. Mm. Pardon me. Um, Cat did ask me how many locos I've got. Uh, quite a lot, but not as much as YouTuber Sam's Trains has. Um, he he seems to be quite a um, what's the word? I can't think of the bloody word. Controversial YouTuber. Um, it seems like he's got a good number of haters as well as a good number of fans and uh, I think I haven't got a problem with him personally and I think um, he's worth a watch um, especially if you're looking to buy new locomotives because he does review new ones um, that's probably one, one of the reasons he's got so many in his attic I can't remember how many he counted up I think it was at least 500 um, locomotives um, so if you're looking for a new one and you just want someone's opinion, then yeah, look up Sam's Trains on YouTube. Um, and he's done some humorous things as well. He's got his own little challenges that he does. Um, where he gives himself a set amount of time to repair a broken locomotive. And if he can't repair it in that time or get it working, it goes in the scrap. <laughs> that's the rule. It has to be working by the end of that time scale. That's, it's, well, claimed to be randomly generated. I'm not really sure if it is a random number generator or not, but the time is randomly generated. Um, but yeah, I think it's quite a fun channel. I think what a lot of people dislike, and again, I think these are more of the hardcore modelers, is the fact that he's got his track on the floor, on the carpet. Um, but uh, he did a video not so long back, you know, addressing that fact. Do you reckon he's done no end of times before? But you know what people are like, they either don't watch the video to the end or, you know, they don't listen. But either way, <clears throat> he actually said, even though he calls it a layout, it's not actually a layer, it's just some track that he has some fun with in the loft because he hasn't got a proper space to build it. Um, and if you saw his attic, there's a lot of wooden supports and things in the way, so it'd be quite hard to do a decent layout up there. Um, <clears throat> so he's just got up running around the loft floor on some carpet. And I can understand people not liking that because the locos can pick up fluff and that can stop the locos from working and whatnot but the way I see it it's they're his locos it's his track let him do what he wants with it if he breaks his locos it's his fault that's his money down the drain isn't it not yours not mine his I really don't understand why people I mean put an opinion out there is one thing but do you have to be nasty over it? You know, have you got to call people names over it because they're doing something like that? You know. And to be fair, he services his trains well. And they all run fine, so I don't see the issue. I mean, Hornby don't supply a board with their um, train sets, do they? No, the kids set them up on the floor, which is what they're designed to do, and then they just run it around on the track on the floor. Has there ever been a problem? And to be fair, out of all these, all of these locos I've bought are used. In fact, I had a bunch given to me, actually, by my stepdad when he decided a few years ago he wanted to go O-Gage. And then when he tried to set it up in the current loft, he realised that was far too big and expensive. That really is expensive to go O-Gage. That's why he's gone back to double O-Gage. But yeah, when he's getting rid of his O-Gage stuff, he pretty much let me have all the non-DCC stuff. So I did get quite a few locos from him. 
but uh, yeah everything I've got is second hand and I've not found anything with carpet fluff or anything like that in it they've had other non-running issues like the um, motor brushes are no good and whatnot but other than that yeah I've not found fluff <clears throat> Anywho, um, yeah, so I'm going to shut this video down here and I might actually go straight back into doing the, uh, the scenery one. So I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope those that are into model railways will find this somewhat useful. Feel free to ask me questions in the comments down below. I'll do my best to answer them. But like I said, I'm by no means an expert at this. Um, yeah, so as always I'm going to leave links to uh, the Discord server and uh, my other two channels in the uh, description down below. Um, I'm sure there was something else I was going to put down there, I can't remember now. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching and I will uh, see you all in the next video. Bye!